No, pero lo dejen aquí. ¿Y el coche? Sí, no, ok. Está grabado. Welcome to today's session of mechatronics on the CCE, CCE 2022. Uh, the first paper is entitled Multi Robot Clocking Control Using Multi Agent Twin Delayed with Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient and is presented by Mr. Mario Salama, uh, Nouran Adel, and Ayman El Badawi. And sorry if I mispronounce some names, uh, but you have about uh, 15 minutes to present and five minutes to, to a session, a short session of questions. Uh, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll share my presentation. Please uh, notify me when it's visible. Ah, in a second. There you go. Okay, good afternoon. I would like to start off by thanking you all for your time and for this opportunity. I'll start off by discussing the problem at hand, which is the multi-robot clocking problem and the reasons behind my interest and passion towards it. Clocking is defined as a group of winged animals. The term is also referred to a group of aerial robots, so the multi-robot clocking problem revolves around a group of robots performing a specific task. UEB's popularity has been increasing drastically the past few years, and its applications are now related to many industries, uh, UEVs are now used in collaborative airlift, photography, search and rescue, geographical mapping, entertainment, and many more. Some of those applications require the use of multiple UEVs at the same time. And here is where the multi-robot flocking problem surfaces. For example, during an aerial show, UEVs must meet certain requirements in order to fulfill the task in hand. They must be able to avoid obstacles, maintain communication, avoid collision, reach a destination, and maintain formation. Proceeding with the approach taken to tackle this problem, reinforcement learning and deep neural networks were used. Starting with the deep neural network section, there are multiple neural network architectures to, to choose from, ANN, RNN, and CNN. The most appropriate architecture was the ANN for its ability to map complex functions. An MLP or a multi-layer perception network was used in this application, which is a class of the ANN. An MLP was built using TensorFlow, which is a library in Python, and a three-layer network was built. It had one input layer, one hidden layer, and one output layer. Uh, now moving forward to the algorithm on the reinforcement learning section. Multi-agent reinforcement learning is a fairly new topic with many new algorithms emerging occasionally. An algorithm that was used before to solve multi-robot flocking control problem is the multi-agent deterministic policy gradient or the MADDPG. Excuse me, uh, can you uh, go ahead the uh, presentation? We can only see the cover of your presentation. One second. Only the first slide is being shown. Only the first slide. Yeah, we are only watching the first slide. Okay, I'll stop and... Do you see the second slide now? Yes, we can see it now. Yeah. Okay. Do I start from the beginning or where I stop? You can, if you can start again. You, if you maybe. Okay. I'll start off by discussing the problem at hand, which is the multi robot. Some of the applications that are used now, uh, one of one of them are one of them is the. Excuse me. It's okay. Go ahead. Okay. 
Moving forward with algorithms and enforcement learning section, multi-agent reinforcement learning is a fairly new topic with many new algorithms emerging occasionally. An algorithm that was used to solve the multi-robot lock and control problem before is the multi-agent deterministic policy gradient or MADDPG. MADDPG extends the DDPG, an all-policy algorithm used for continuous action spaces, into a multi-agent policy gradient algorithm where decentralized agents learn a centralized predict based on the observation and the actions of all the agents. After training is completed, only the local actors are used at execution phase, acting in a decentralized manner, so it, is, it uses decentralized execution and centralized training. The MADDPG faced multiple issues when solving the multi-agent deterministic model. When solving the multi-agent flocking problem, like slow convergence time, low learning efficiency, overestimation of the Q values, and falling into a local optima. What I proposed is to try a newly founded algorithm called MATD3, or a multi-agent policy security, uh, with the flocking control problem. MATD3 is an extension for the DD3, the twin delayed deterministic policy gradient, which is the successor to the DPG. DD3 was introduced in 2016 to address the drawbacks accompanied with the DPG. DD3 solved those, it solved those issues by introducing three features to the DPG. The first feature is flip double Q learning. TD learns two Q functions instead of one and uses the smaller of the two Q values to form the target in the Bellman error loss function. The second feature is the late policy updates. TD3 updates the policy less frequently than the Q functions. One policy update for every two Q function update. The last feature is target policy smoothing. TD3 adds noises to the target action to make it harder for the policy to exploit Q function errors by smoothing out Q values along changes in action. MATD3 emerged in 2019 and adopted the same techniques and methodologies as the TD3 in addition to multi-agent system with centralized training and decentralized execution, similar to the MADDPG application, but without the problems of the MADDPG. Now, to test both algorithms and confirm whether or not MATD3 is in fact a better fit for the multi-agent flocking problem or not, I chose a particle environment built in Python. I started by setting the layout for my environment and the number of agents and obstacles. So for the layout, starting with the size of my environment, I chose the size of my environment based on the fact that most UEV control systems use 2.4 gigahertz uh, for UEV control and 5 gigahertz for video transmission. This setup will give the user approximately 6 kilometers of range. So the environment I built has the dimensions of 5,500 meters by 3,000 meters. Proceeding with the formation after researching uh, the many available formations adopted by UEVs, such as aero, hexagonal, circular, and diamond formations, I have chosen the diamond formation for multiple reasons. It provides the UEVs with a quick change in direction if needed and is flexible with the number of UEVs required. Uh, I chose the size of my. Now, moving on with the number of agents, I chose five agents in a diamond formation and tried to scale their size to the environment built. Particles were all given the same size of 200 millimeters. The number was chosen based on that most two squat opter frames are usually between 180 to 250 millimeters. I also chose 10 obstacles and one destination to be placed in my environment. Now, for the placement, the five agents always started the episode in the middle of the environment while in a diamond formation. The destination or target is randomly placed on the boundaries of the environment to ensure that the formation travels a moderate distance enough for training each episode. Lastly, the obstacles are randomly placed in the section between the agent and the destination to make sure that each episode, the agent would have to encounter at least one obstacle in order for the policy to learn how to evade obstacles more quickly. Now, proceeding with my reward function. Four different reward functions were designed to satisfy the requirement of the flock problem. The first reward function, was for the purpose of teaching the agent to reach the destination. Each agent had a specific position that it needed to be relative to the destination. A negative reward or punishment was given to the agent each step if the agent is not within the clearance range. The negative reward function is then uh, is equal to the distance between the target position and the agent. If the agent is at the desired position, then a positive reward of post four is retained. This process is repeated each and every step for each and every agent. 
The second reward function is for training the policy to maintain communication between the agents. Now, UEV to UEV communication is set uh, by using 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi mesh networks. This type of network has a range of about 500 meters, though the reward function was built accordingly. Each step, I check if the distance between any agent and another agent is more than 500 meters, then a negative reward of negative 10 is given to the agent. Thirdly, the, the third reward function is used to train the policy to avoid collision within the flow. Each step, the distance between every agent and the other agents is calculated. If they are within a dangerous range from each other, which I specify to be 400 millimeters, a negative reward of negative 10 is returned. The last word function is designed to avoid uh, to train the agents to avoid obstacles. Similar to the collision avoidance, each step the distance from each agent and all the obstacles are measured. If the distance is within a dangerous zone specified to be 400 millimeters, a negative reward of negative 10 is returned. After calculating the reward function separately, they are multiplied by a weight and added together to form the final reward value returned in policy. These weights ensure that all the, all the reward functions have the same priority while maximizing the final reward. Now, moving on to the results, I'll be comparing both algorithms side by side for each reward function separately. The first reward, func first reward function is the destination reward. For the MATD3, the policy converged after 150,000 episodes on a final reward of most of 150. The positive value is an indication that the agents reach a destination successfully, while MADDPG converged after 20,000 episodes on a final reward of negative 200, which shows that it converged on an unoptimal solution and failed to finish the task at hand. Second is the connectivity reward. Both algorithms behave similarly regarding this reward function. Third is the collision uh, avoidance reward function. For the MATD3, the policy converged after 230,000 episodes on a final reward of negative 20, which translates to approximately two collisions every 1,000 episodes. While MADDPG, on the other hand, converged after 250,000 episodes on a final reward of negative 50, which translates to approximately five collisions every 1,000 episodes. Uh, that shows that it converged on a suboptimal solution and has a slow convergence rate. Lastly, the obstacle avoidance reward function. For the MATD3, the policy converged after 80,000 episodes on a final reward of negative 125, which translates to approximately five collisions every 1,000 episodes. While MADDPG did not converge within the 300,000 episodes and had a final reward of negative 400, which translates to approximately 16 collisions every 1,000 episodes, which shows that it converged on an unoptimal solution and has a slow convergence rate. Now, I'd like to show you a video of the agents performing the flocking task after being trained by each algorithm. Now, starting with the MADDPG, you can see that it is not optimal. Uh, agents do not maintain the formation or reach the destination in a desired formation. In addition, collision with the obstacles and between one another does occur. Next, with the MATD3, it is clear that it has converged on a more optimal solution with minimal collisions with obstacles and with one another while maintaining the formation throughout the episode till reaching the destination, thus performing the, flock, the flocking task successfully. These are some recommendations, uh, in my opinion, are applicable for future work. Um, these, these are my references. And um, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we are proceeding to the session of questions. Is there anyone here who would like to ask a question about this work? Go ahead, please. Uh, hi, Mario. Uh, Hello. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, well, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, how did you find uh, those uh, weights for your uh, reward function? I see uh, you have very long uh, numbers, and it seems weird to me. Uh, so I, I, I want to know how did you find them? 
Okay, I chose the first word function. Uh, yeah, I chose, I, I began. Sorry? Yes, those, how did you find them? Okay, I began, I began with one word function and I calculated the maximum, uh, the maximum value it returned. And then I tried uh, regulating the rest of the word functions to have the same maximum value. So if they're all going to have the same range, it's like I mapped them uh, to a specific maximum range. So the first one I set to one, and the rest I calibrated to have the same maximum or the same range as the first one. So the only one you, you did by, by, by handle is the first one? Yes. The first one I calculated the maximum it's going to return, and then the rest I... Um, I mapped it to okay. have the same maximum value as the first one. Okay, okay. Uh, second question, how, how many agents did you use? Uh, I, 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 I tried nine and I tried five, but for the sake of training, I, uh, the, the, all the results posted were with the five agents. Okay, and, and just the, the third one, comparing with uh, the normal TD3 uh, algorithm, how much uh, is accelerated by using this multi-agent uh, structure you're proposing? Uh, the results were really good compared to the old uh, algorithms used. Uh, it had it, it converged faster on a on a result. If if we're gonna use the old algorithm, it's gonna need more episodes to train in order to reach the same uh, output. If it's gonna reach the same output. So with the newly proposed algorithm, it reaches a better output in less time, and it was visible in the videos that the two uh, algorithms were trained the same number of episodes with the same agents, same uh, uh, environment, same everything, and it showed that it converged better on a more optimal solution. Yeah, yeah, but comparing it with the normal TD3, how much does this okay. does it TD3 can only be used with single agent, so it's yeah. not applicable with the flocking control problem. So I haven't used it uh, to train one agent okay. because it's, it's not applicable in this case. So I have to use like multi-agent uh, algorithm. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Is there another question from the people present here or the people in the virtual session? No. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to you. Uh, this was a very interesting presentation. It was great uh, contribution to the CCA. And uh, we extend our thanks. Thank you very much. You're welcome. presentation is uh, uh, for the paper entitled Semi-Active semi Probe Vehicle Dynamics by Implementing Neurofossy Control and Damper and is uh, authored by Ahmed al Rafai, uh, Mohamed Ibrahim and uh, Esham Ibrahim. I'm sorry again for if I mispronounce some of the names. Uh, but uh, again, you have uh, 15 minutes to present, and then we will proceed to a session of question and answers. So uh, you have, if you're ready, you have the 15 minutes. Please go ahead. So, can everyone see my slides? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Ahmad Asam, and I will be the presenter for our paper titled uh, Excuse me. Excuse me. 
you can go ahead. Yeah, you can go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. For our paper, our paper titled Semi-Active Road Vehicle Dynamics by Implementing Neurofuzzy Control Damper, it's a pleasure for me to present my paper in front of you all. Going into the outline, I'll be presenting the problem statement and then a brief description of the suspension system used in our paper, then the variable damper explanation, going into the quarter car model, full car model. These are the models that are implemented on different control techniques, such as the PID controller and the neurofuzzy controller. Then going into the results and the observations, conclusions, and room for any questions. <clears throat> First of all, my problem statement in this is that in this study, a neurofuzzy controller is implemented based on a PID fuzzy rules for a seven degree of freedom for car model to improve the sprung mass acceleration and pitch in terms of suspension dynamics. The choice of implementing the neurofuzzy controller on a seven degree of freedom full car model is due to the absence of the pitch and rolls degrees of freedom that will be shown later in the next figure in the linear quarter car model. Implementing a neurofuzzy controller on a quarter car model takes into consideration only the sprung mass displacement and acceleration, which is considered insufficient for the full analysis of the neurofuzzy controller effect on the ride experience. This is the pitch and roll degrees of freedom that I talked about. Going from here into the suspension system and the suspension system various types when studying suspension dynamics are the passive suspension and the semi-active suspension and the active suspension. The semi-active suspension, uh, assuming linearity of the suspension components, contains only the spring, which is modeled here as Ks, the damper, which is represented here as Vs, the semi-active suspension uh, system introduces a new term, which is the B-semi, which is the variable damper, which will be explained later, and the active suspension uh, uses the actuator. In our implementation, we mainly focus on semi-active suspension for two main reasons, which are that the semi-active suspension works as a passive suspension when the failure of suspension components happen, while the active suspension stops functioning. Also, it's significantly cheaper than the active suspension because active suspension provides extra force and is used for setting the roll, pitch, motion, and vibrations of the car body. As you said, the, 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 the semi-active suspension uses a variable damper. Then the variable damper we'll be using is the MR damper, which is known as the magnetorheological damper. This damper consists of an electromagnetic coil in the piston head, as shown here. The choice of the material is tremendously important this kind of damper, as the magnetic steel is used for the piston. Here, by the magnetic steel is used for the rod to avoid the flux leakage through the coil. The MR fluid is a type of oil that con con uh, contains magnetic micron-sized particles. When the magnetic field is absent, uh, the, the fluid is in a free-flowing state uh, with, uh, with low viscosity and thus low damping force. Applying current to the damper changes the fluid into semi-solid state. The existence of the semi-active, uh, the existence of the variable damper ensures that we can control the semi-active suspension to achieve greater ride comfort. The, control contro uh, the controller controls the force coming out of the variable damper by changing the current, thus changing the magnetic field, which changes the viscosity, which changes the damping force. These controller types can be implemented on the electric con uh, electronic control unit, the ECU of the vehicle. Going into the linear quarter car model, assuming vehicle symmetry, here is the model that will be implementing different control techniques on. K as the spring constant, BS is damping coefficient, which is considered constant at this case because it's linear behavior, and KT here is the tire stiffness. Using Newtonian modeling technique, or specifically Newton's second law, here is the equations of motions we are, we are using to model the quarter car linear suspension system. Assuming vehicle symmetry, as we said, and that each wheel has an effect and, uh, of, the, uh, of the spring and the damper of the other wheel and linearity of the suspension component, a linear full car model was developed, as shown here. The motions applicable in a full car models are the sprung mass bounce and the sprung mass roll, the sprung mass pitch and the unsprung mass bounce wheel one, two and three, four, which are shown here, wheel one, two, three and four. Using also Newtonian modeling technique, Newton's second law, and the convention upward direction is the positive direction, and the anticlockwise is the positive direction. The model is developed for the equations of the motion of the seven degree of freedom full car model, as shown here. The XS1 and the XS2 and the XS3 and the XS4 are the variables that can be plugged in here and can be obtained using geometry of the vehicle model. 
PID controller is one of the most famous control techniques, and we will be using it in our implementation of the neurofuzzy controller. Uh, the name of the controller comes from the nature of the equations defining the controller and the nature of every gain the controller has. Uh, as uh, as explained here, this is the equation modeling the PID controller. Uh, the, the, the gains for the PID controller are adjusted in our implementation using the PID tuner in MATLAB, assuming linear behavior for all suspension components. And then you and going to the neuro fuzzy controller. Be, be, before digging into the neuro fuzzy controller, we must uh, speak a little about the fuzzy controller because the fuzzy controller is a linguistic based oriented system which allows for the synthesis of the control signal on the basis of the expert knowledge. This the expert knowledge is stored in the form of if then rules. These are the main components of the fuzzy controller, like a fuzzy fire, inference engine, and the fuzzy fire, as shown here in these in this diagram. The fuzzy con the fuzzy controller uses a membership functions that two most important membership functions and most widely used are the, are the triangular membership functions and the Gaussian membership functions. As shown here, we used Gaussian membership functions in our implementation in the uh, neurofuzzy controller. This is the MATLAB software picture of the neurofuzzy controller. To solve the problem of the fuzzy, uh, fuzzy controller, which is the lack of the expertise uh, uh, to generate the fuzzy rules, the fuzzy rules may um, have some error because it's uh, based on human uh, experts. The neurofuzzy is used to generate the fuzzy rules using machine learning and neural networks in combination with fuzzy logic to achieve human-like reasoning style. To perform this, the neurofuzzy has to be trained on data from an already existing controller, just such as the PID, as I said so. The main strength of such a neurofuzzy system is their ability to be accurate approximators. In this case, the neurofuzzy is approximating the PID response. This is an example of the ANN network. Image generates a table showing the inputs and outputs of the PID controller. This we implemented on MATLAB. This data was inserted on the MATLAB neuro fuzzy tool. Then empty fuzzy rules was generated with one input, one output, and seven membership functions. The rules were then trained for 100 epoch until the optimal rules were generated. Going into the results. The figure below shows the sprung mass displacement passive simulated versus the PID controlled in the quarter call model. And here shows a very slight, a slight improvement in displacement because our main goal was to improve the acceleration as shown in the next figure. And the next figure is the sprung mass acceleration for the quarter car model. Here shows that that uh, performance overshoot was improved by nearly 10%, which is a very good performance improvement. Going into the full car model, the acceleration here shows significant improvement. In, as shown here in settling time, in neurofuzzy controller acceleration at time of impact has a maximum overshoot, and this is because of the trade-off to control the pitch, and the pitch is really important in controlling it in the seven degrees of freedom full car suspension model in order for us to have a good vehicle ride and ride comfort safety. Also, here, this is the pitch uh, result. Uh, this is the pitch results. Uh, shows a significant improvement, as we said so, and this is the... by the red line here. To conclude, the passive responses in both the quarter car and the full car model in terms of the sprung mass displacement and acceleration. When PID controller was applied on the quarter car model, the response improved in the acceleration as desired as we want. Eurofuzzy and PID controllers are then implemented on the full car model using similar numerical values. Eurofuzzy controller improved the response of the acceleration of the full car model. Dynamics offers a trade off in the sprung mass acceleration as a higher overshoot occurs relative to the quarter score model response. The quarter core suspension, the overshoot of the acceleration in the point of impact is not existent due to the ignorance of the pitch in the two degrees of freedom quarter core model. Questions? Thank you so much. Okay. Is that all? Excuse me. I finished are my presentation. Ah, excellent. Thank you very much. Now Thank we you. are to proceed uh, to a round of questions. Are there any uh, of the public attendants uh, willing to make a question? Anyone? Question? 
All attendees can open their microphones if they wish to ask a question also. Uh, I will have a, a question. Uh, I would like to ask uh, in this, uh, well, in the, this is the uh, slide okay. number 22, uh, I think. In, in slide, uh, which slide, please? The last one, I mean, this. The last one, slide. this is the conclusion. This, this is the, the conclusion, okay. Uh, but you show one slide uh, before this one. Uh, where you have, uh, it was the last one you were talking about. This, this, yeah, the, the, this is the pitch. The, 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 this is the full core uh, pitch, and this is the full core acceleration. Okay. Uh, this is the. It was. Uh, I, I guess it was the twenty-two, the, the slide number twenty-two. 22, yeah, 22 is the full core pitch, yes. This is the first slide. Can you, you show us slide number 22? Yeah, this is slide number 22. Uh, we have seen slide number 23. It's slide number 22. Can everyone see slide number 22? Uh, no. No, we are watching 23. Slide 23, that's the one we are watching. Okay. There is. Second. Well, okay. I yeah. Know. This one. Exactly. This one okay. is. Uh, I was asking for. Uh, why is it that the PID? Response shows a uh, change in the phase of the response precisely. Why does the PID shows what? Uh, change in the phase. Uh, I mean, uh, the PID shows uh, the first uh, overshot is is uh, uh, is. Uh, yeah, this is this is due to this is due to the the. It's due that to the trade-off we did in order to control the pitch. Um, the, the, we here we have a maximum overshoot at the start, the PID and the neuro fuzzy. And as we said, the neuro fuzzy is based upon the PID, so they will react some, somehow similar to each other. Um, but the neuro fuzzy has a better response, of course, because it's trained on uh, more, more data and it's used machine learning. But uh, here, in order to have the best response on the pitch, we had to have a trade off in the strong mass acceleration in the PID and in the neuro fuzzy control. Yes, of course. And this was the conclusion of the, of the paper. Okay. Uh, well, uh, you are using a magnetological damper. Magnetological damper, yeah. So uh, I, I, well, I mean, this maybe is going a little far, but uh, uh, have you considered to uh, get into account the, the hysteresis effect on those dampers because they are magnetical? Yes, how, we, we, we. How do you think uh, it's going to, to, it is going to occur? All the, the behavior. Yes, the, the, the variable damper has a magnetic effect, of course, and has a flux leakage and um, these loops. And we are using, uh, we are assuming the, the variable damper has no losses. We are, we are assuming that the variable damper is no losses. It's the, um, There is another question that is that uh, they are asking is virtual session, uh, and it says what kind of model are you using for the MR damper, and how is this related uh, with the overall system performance? Uh, 
what kind of model are you using for the MR damper and how is this new photo? Okay, we are using the, the uh, I, I modeled the MR damper model um, like here, the equations, I wrote it here in the word, but it's it's modeled in the simulink model I uh, did. Let's see. Okay. Um, I, uh, I related the force with the current and the viscosity is the constraints uh, is the constraint I have. So it's a simulink blocks which uh, relates the mathematical model of the magnetic uh, of the MR damper. Um, uh, the force is the output and the current is the input. And this is the mathematical equation uh, that I had before. It's, it's, it's already in my simulink model which, which I implemented on this on the, on the paper. Thank you very much. There is another question. And um, it says, are these results consistent with the results of similar studies? We have it in share on the virtual presentation. Thank you so much. What is asking? Are these results consistent with the results of similar studies? Uh, yes, it is consistent, but um, with similar studies, yes. A lot of most of studies implemented the neuro fuzzy controller on a quarter car model only and obtained more or less the same results. What we did is that we obtained the neuro fuzzy controller on a full car model, which uh, a lot didn't um, because its, uh, its implementation is really hard, but uh, we did implement it on the full car model and obtained more or less the same values when implementing fuzzy controller only, but implementing fuzzy controller only requires knowing the fuzzy rules from before. And not all models we know the fuzzy rules of. So yes, we implemented Euro fuzzy for generalizing the solution. Okay. There are another question. Well, it seems it's it's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We appreciate the contribution uh, of your work to the CCA conference, and uh, we give you thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next talk is the next presentation is to be given by um, uh, Mr. Hector Sanchez Villegas, uh, Luis uh, Gerardo Trujillo Franco, and Hugo Abundisong. The paper is entitled On the Evaluation of Key Free Decay and Import Response Model Testing Techniques. And uh, the same you have about uh, minutes to present and then uh, there will be a five minutes session of questions and answers so uh, if you are ready please proceed okay there's my presentation already on screen yes we can see your presentation on the screen. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hector Sava Sanchez Villegas. And today I'm going to present you our work named on the evaluation of free decay and impulse response model testing techniques. This is the content of my presentation. I'm going to show you the introduction, the methodology, results, and finally the conclusions. Well, as introduction, this work focuses on the evaluation of model testing techniques based on the impulse response and free decay excitation techniques. This is all by analyzing the dynamic behavior of an electric system with the mathematical fundamentals of two one degrees of freedom model parameters extraction techniques that are peak feeding and circle feeding. These techniques are presented and then experimentally evaluated in a sixth order electric system.
Now about the methodology, consider a general signal G of T that comes from a transient response of a vibratory system with not zero initial conditions of each harmonic components. It is possible to determine the model representation of such a signal. This is an uncomplete version of the output obtained using an analytical model of the system. The schematic representation of the model analysis of a transient signal is presented as a linear combination of a single harmonic content and is depicted in the shown figure. The signal G of T is considered to be quantificable or measurable in a time interval between T0 and T1. The model testing techniques are used to determine experimentally the model parameters as the model amplitude, natural frequency, and the model damping radio to construct the model model of the system from its transient response. We have two transient response analysis techniques in this work. First, the peak peeling method that is also known and the mean, as a mean power method. This method is very portable and computationally cost effective to extract model parameters. And then is the circle fit method that is more complex than peak pitting, that is based on the assumption of the circularity of the FRF near the resonance. Circle fit demand a higher resolution in the frequency response function giving a better capability of identifying natural frequencies. In the case of peak picking, the model parameters are obtained from the frequency response function as the first equation, where omega sub r is the frequency at the peak of the FRF with a magnitude a sub r. Then the damping radio is estimated with this equation, the second equation. This is omega sub A less than omega sub B. There are frequencies where the amplitude reaches a value of A sub A comma B equal to 0 0.7 A sub R value. The model constant A sub I is directly, directly related with the amplitude of the peak. And finally, phase alpha sub i is determined for the imaginary part of the FRF. For the circle fit, the model parameters are given by the first equation below, where omega sub r is the undamped natural frequency that is determined graphically, and the angles theta a and theta b are shown in the figure. The diameter of the circle is directly related of the model to the model constant, as shows the second equation below, where the r is the diameter of the circle obtained by a fitting method as this squares. The circle field technique is more is more complex and it is necessity necessity of use trigonometric calculations. In the case of peak picking, we only need a few points of the frequency response function, and most of the times we can obtain the missing points using the cubic interpolation techniques. And peak picking is quite simple since no derivatives are needed. About the vibration, the vibrating electric system, considering the one that is shown in the picture, where the couple system dynamics is modeled by the set of couple differential equations, where L, R, and C are the inductance, resistance, and capaci capacitance, respectively. K took the values between 1 and 3, and A sub K are the main currents, and B sub S is the voltage source. Now, the matrix representation of the system of equation is this, the first equation, where the inductance, resistance, and capacitance matrices are given by these matrices. Finally, 
In frequencies domain, the expression in principal coordinates of the model analysis representation of the system is this equation. Notice that the, this equation is a set of a compute second order or linear different, differential equations with a model matrix act, acting as a linear transform and, is, and it is constructed by using a column of space of agent solutions. For the evaluation of the model parameters extraction techniques, some experiments were performed. The system parameters are shown in the table number one. There are the inductance, resistance, and capacitance for each degree of freedom. And the theoretical parameters of the system are reported in the table two in a similar way for each, de for each degree of freedom. Impulsive response and free decay were used as extensions to perform the experimental model analysis. The first test was the impulse response. It was used a 32 byte and an ARM architecture microcontroller to generate a pulse with an amplitude of one volt and a duration of 100 microseconds to emulate a pulse excitation of the circuit. The system response was characterized by taking measurements of the capacitor's voltages at a sample rate of 100,000 samples per second. In this figure, you can observe the system response and the excitation signal in the time domain. The frequency response functions are shown in the first figure. As you can see, we have continuous lines that means a good signal to know, to know its radio. The 3D diagram shows Nyquist plot as a fu function of frequency instead of a curve trajectory. This plot shows the phases with implicit mode shapes of the system, the phases of each capacitor voltages are equivalent to the model shapes of the electric system and are graphically represented. At the end of this test, the model parameters were estimated with both techniques. They are shown in the next table. Now we have the 3 decay test, and this test was performed by applying a constant voltage of one volt digitally generated by, a ten, by the 10 bits digital to analog converter of the ARM processor. The constant voltage was applied to the circuit during one second, and then the DSA was turned off to simulate a change in the initial conditions of the electric system. Here you can see the system response and the excitation signal in time domain. This figure shows the frequency response functions of the free decay test we can observe a purer signal-to-noise radio compared to the impulse response one. In this table, the model parameters in estimated in this test are shown. And finally, we have this comparison of results that is presented in this table, where the mean value of both techniques is compared to the analytical values for each excitation input. As you can see, the values are expressed in percentage of difference, and they are quite similar to the numerical simulations. Finally, as a conclusion, we have the, a calibration towards a future application of two transit response methods was performing in an electric, electric system. 
The transient response methods are easier to implement in electric systems compared to their mechanical version due, the, due to the strict control over the input signal. And finally, based on the results of the test, the impulse response test is more stable and adequate for the extraction model of parameters. And that's all. Thanks for your attention. We are proceeding to the session of questions and answers. So, uh, any one of the presents uh, have uh, any question, please go ahead. Also, uh, in the virtual session, if anyone would like to ask a question, please go ahead. All attendees are allowed to open their microphones if they wish to ask a question. Well, um, I have a question. Uh, can you show me the slide number eight? This light. Yeah, this one. Here uh, in the last expression, uh, you have this Q I of S. Uh, what does this Q I of S represent in the physical sense? Why Q sub S? Why sub I? Yes, that one. That's the. Uh, do, do you hear me? You see the Because uh, in the sense of the model analysis, those represents the model coordinates, right? Yep. yep. But, uh, the model coordinates, uh, generally, we cannot associate them uh, with directly with the with the physical uh, uh, physical uh, quantity uh, most of the times. There are like uh, some other displacements, but uh, if we are talking about uh, mechanics, they are other displacement, displacements. Excuse me. But here, uh, these model displacements, uh, since your system is an electric system, uh, how can we understand them? Are they voltages? Are they, are they currents? They are currents. Currents, electrical currents, right? And the uh, and the matrix, the theta matrix C, one of I, so one I. Can you repeat, please? Uh, the audio. Yeah. That's not the, good. The C by R variable that is uh, multiplying the first derivative of the voltage. Psi matrix? That one. That's the model matrix. The model matrix. Yeah. <laughs> they would represent, in mechanics, they would represent the model shapes, right? Yeah. So how can we interpret them in this uh, electrical system? Okay. Because, for example, if, if you have uh, three uh, 
uh, three mass spring damper system connected, uh, interconnected in series, as you have these stages of uh, capacitors, uh, inductors, and resistors. Uh, well, that the interpretation of the modal shapes would be the shape they take the displacement uh, when the cards, for example, are going all the same direction, then one one direction and the, and the second the other, and the third one the same direction as, as the first, there would be the total of three modal shapes. In this case, uh, it is the same, but uh, how can we interpret those modal shapes since it is not a mechanical system? This is, is the way the, the voltage is oscillating. There, the voltage, the currents, because they are multiplied by the voltage, and they yeah. represents the way the voltage uh, oscillates. All right, so uh, there is a uh, there is a sense in, in each uh, each lattice of the circuit in which uh, the current is uh, can go uh, one direction or in another. So this matrix is is what tells what kind of what kind of configuration we have after all, isn't it? The, the matrix is well by the Asian vectors. Yeah, and that tells us uh, when all the currents are synchronized, they're going the same direction, but when they are uh, one opposite to the another. Is that right? I can hear you. Uh, the, the audio is very low. Okay. Uh, well, it seems that this matrix is uh, related to the direction the current has in every lattice of your network, isn't it? Well, uh, which method, uh, you presented two methods, which one would you prefer to apply, peak picking or, or circle picking? They are, they are both uh, a good techniques, but peak picking is more simple. Circle fitting is more complex, but needs more memory from the computer. And which one, to your experience, is more accurate? Circle fitting. Circle fitting is more accurate. Okay. Yes, yeah, more accurate. Okay. Is there another question anyone would like to ask? It's about the thing. There is one question here. Can you, Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, because you are you are applying model analysis techniques uh, for electrical systems. Because you are applying model analysis techniques for mechanical systems, and and the question by Fernando was about the the geometrical representation of the model shapes, and you you have answered that uh, and that uh, by solving the IG problem, but uh, it would be more illustrative if you show the geometrical description of the eigenvectors. vectors. 
uh, to illustrate uh, your description. So that, that was my comment. Okay, thank you. Is there another question? Okay, well, uh, it seems that it could, be, uh, it could be everything. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's an interesting idea to apply a model analysis to an electric system. Uh, we appreciate your contribution in the CCT 2022 uh, conference. So, uh, thank you very much. El commander no es el peor. Okay. Well, now uh, everything okay? Yeah. Yeah. Presentation is. Yeah. It's, it's good. Okay. We have. Uh, essential presentation now and uh, the paper is entitled development of vision algorithm for flow range relative navigation on the water vehicles and the authors of this work are uh, Mr. Isaac Alejandro Garcia Riones, Mr. Benjamin Nicolás Trinidad, Mr. Salatiel Garcia Nava uh, Mr. Fabrice de Bars, Mr. Sergio Salazar Cruz, and Mr. Filiberto Muñoz Palacios. And we have the honor of have here presenting this paper. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alejandro Garcia. I'm going to talk about the topic of the development of a vision algorithm for flood range relative navigation of underwater vehicles. The main topic that we're going to talk about. Uh, first, I'm going to speak about the, the problem that we tried to tackle with this research. Then I'm going to uh, talk about the, the, the description of how this algorithm works, each of uh, each of these steps that make the, the tracking. Then I'm going to talk about the mathematical modeling and control for the for testing its tracking capabilities. Then I'm going to present the experimental results that we got, and afterwards, and I'm going to finish with the conclusions and the future work of this, of this topic. Well, the main problem that we're trying to tackle, tackle here is to obtain a position that is relative to an inertial frame or a point of interest. This is to obtain the, re the relative position of an underwater autonomous vehicle. Uh, and this this has uh, many difficulties, uh, especially because it is a submarine environment that has its, its peculiar characteristics. One of these is that uh, a GPS cannot be used underwater, so there are there have been some workarounds to tackle this issue. One of those is is accosting positioning. This is used mainly for mid-range position estimation. The other one that is uh, fairly well known in research in the literature is optical positioning, and this works mainly for short, short range. As it allows as well for orientation estimation and not only for, for the position estimation. Uh, and in this, in this research, we developed an algorithm that, that tracks this uh, point of interest using uh, optical and uh, an optimal tracking system. We we used a uh, five LED light, lights arranged in a determined position that form a marker. This marker can be attached to another vehicle for making a multi-agent navigation or can be, can be attached as well to a fixed point of interest that can be an underwater structure or anything that that you would like to use as a point of reference for uh, relative navigation in underwater environments. 
In this first figure, we show the lead marker. It is attached to another vehicle for making a, a mobile reference that another vehicle, an autonomous vehicle, must track. This, this ha it has five LED lights, and it, they're named from A to E, from left to right. Um, in this figure, we show the, the diagram or the two coordinate systems. The first one is the camera coordinate system. It has its story in the focal center of the camera. This camera is, uh, is on board a uh, Blue Rock 2. There is an autonomous under, underwater vehicle. And the other coordinate system is the marker coordinate system. It is, um, like I said before, it is attached to another vehicle. It is the Optosuit. Now I'm going to talk, to talk about each one of these steps that the algorithm follows for tracking the, this marker. The first one is the video stream capture. We used a GStreamer, GStreamer pipeline to obtain the raw image that is recorded you know, by the monocular that is recorded by the monocular camera on board of the Blue Rock vehicle, and we used the uh, OpenCV Python library for processing the, the image. The next step of the algorithm is an HSV color space conversion. This conversion is Perform to A to a color-based segmentation. This color-based segmentation will be done to detecting the light and as well detecting the color of each of the LEDs. This figure shows the frame after it has been converted to a color space, to a HSV color space. Afterwards, the next step, the next step of the algorithm, it is a mask. This mask it is used for segmenting high-intensity white color. It is applied to this HSV frame that, that was converted in the previous step. And this mask, it is used for detecting the lights that are present on the frame. This, this mask makes a binary image, and this binary image has every, every single source of, of light that it is detected on the frame. So the next step of the algorithm is to detect candidate of lights that are, that are present in the image. These candidates are several lights. It can be lights that belong to our marker, or it can be lights from external sources of light. For example, our marker is, here is the five LED lights that are in the, in the image that is, it is not reflected. And it, it has a reflection of, because of the surface, but that uh, that would be a mistake if our algorithm tracks the reflected image. So the peculiarity of this algorithm is that it can detect which of the lights belong to our system and which of the lights be, belong to external sources of light, and it filters them. So it only tracks our, our marker and not other lights. Uh, well, uh, for detecting which of the lights belong to our system, we apply another mask. This mask is to detect each of the colors of the RGB uh, of spectrum, a uh, red mask, a green mask, and a blue mask. And these are applied to each one of the detected lights. So we can detect which is the predominant color in, in every one of the sources of light that we have previously detected. In this image, I show you the, the three masks that are applied to each one of the contours of the candidate of lights that we found in the previous step. The first one is the red color mask, the second one is the green color mask, and the third one is the blue color mask. Uh, after applying every one of these three masks, we, we using uh, binary operations, we find out which is the predominant color of each of the detected lights. Afterwards, now that we know the color of each one of these lights, we make a geometric disposition check. That is, we check the geometric that is, that is formed between each and every single uh, light that was detected. And we, for this, we use the constraints. Since we know how the real orientation and how the real mark looks like, we, make some, we use some of these constraints, for example, like on the left side, there must be a, a red light. On the right side, there must be a blue light. In the middle of each shoe, there must be a green one. 
And since we know several of these constraints, we can filter which of these lights belong to our marker from the other lights. And for example, the, the, the marker is traced in the, in the lights that are below. So it, it can show that it makes the distinction from which lights belong to the mirror that is for this, from the surface and which lights belong to our actual marker. And this is also one of um, the main contributions of this uh, research because there are several approaches that work similar with light beacons in underwater, uh, in underwater environments, but all of them, or usually most of them, are uh, only tested in, in high depths, and not on the surface. So yeah, this algorithm can work on the surface, or if there are several vehicles on on the frame. So the next step, the next step of the algorithm is to calculate this distance. Now that we have detected the marker and we detect the distance in pixels in every pair of these lights, we can calculate the distance from the camera to the marker. We use this using these two equations. The first one it's an average because uh, since we can calculate this distance using every single pair of lights. We can use it only using two a pair of lights, but there are six pairs in total. So we make an average of the distance calculated using each pair of lights. And this uh, distance, this independent individual distance that is calculated using an individual pair of lights is the equation two. Here, F is the focal center. S is the height of the sensor. These two are given by the manufacturer of the camera. But since it's an experimental approach, it must be corroborated with the real data that we are getting. And D is the actual distance between these lights, the one that we know in the surface. And K is a factor given by a, by a ratio that is the distance in pixels of, between each of these lights divided by the size of the frame. We calculate this distance, and then we calculate the angles between the two, uh, the two coordinate systems. These angles are alpha and beta, and these are calculated using the field of view, the horizontal and the vertical field of view of the camera. These are also given by the manufacturer, but also are corroborated, corroborated through, experimental, uh, through experiments with the uh, real underwater conditions. And that is because uh, the field of view are different. It, if the camera is on the surface, so it's under work. Uh, P and C are, are the distance in pixels from the center of the frame and the center of and the center of the frame respectively. Now using these three parameters, we can triangulate the, the coordinates that that belong to the coordinate system of the camera, which are given by these three equations. Now that we know this. Uh, and th this figure shows the real-time algorithm working in, in the Blue Rock 2 platform. Uh, below the, it, it is shown the lights that are detected. This is a low light environment uh, estimation. It, it works in both low light environments and, and high lighting condition as well. Uh, here, the figure shows the detected marker, and in the bottom of the frame, we can show the, the coordinates that are estimated by this algorithm. And now, for proving the tracking capabilities of this real-time estimation, we used uh, a control law. It, this was given, it, it was given, it was used a super twisting control. Here is the mathematical modeling. We only use the longitudinal and natural dynamics and were simplified and are given by this equation. This equation can be expressed in a second order representation given by the equation nine, where F is equal to zero and the rest of the terms are given by these four equations on the bottom of the screen. The the super twisting controller is given by this control law, the one in equation 10. And um, well, the sliding surface is defined by this, by this equation, and the tracking errors are, are these two. 
And also here is denoted the desired trajectory. This desired trajectory is the position that is estimated using the vision algorithm on real time. Now for the experimental results, we uh, we uh, the, these are the, are the main things that we found using uh, using this algorithm. The tracking can be done without the need of a custom positioning. And another novelty of this approach is that in daylight and high lighting con conditions, it can detect the light markers. For these experimental results, we use the, this the, this platform that is shown in this uh, diagram. We had the vision algorithm working on a ground station that it uses ROS um, Mavros for communicating with our experimental platform. We used a tether cable for making this communication. We use a tether cable for making this uh, real-time communication to, the, to our device that was on board of the experimental platform. That it consisted of a feedstock and a Raspberry Pi. Uh, the Raspberry was connected to the camera. And our results uh, are are shown in this picture. In this first test, we had a fixed reference point that the controller must. Uh, must really remain. This is a relative position. So the target vehicle can be moving. Um, this reference is static, but, but in reality, both of the vehicles are moving. And the, the, they try to, to keep the same distance between each one of them. This is our fixer experiment. It was a fixed point. Then we tried with different uh, positions. It's the same experiment. We we have a fixed position, but in reality, both of the targets can be moving because this is only a relative position between each one of them. The third experiment was a trajectory that was uh, that what was tested was tracked using this algorithm. The, here, the vehicle, the target vehicle, was fixed at a certain point, and the other one had made had to make a trajectory. Just you see in this camera. Uh, also, uh, use for these experiments, we use no input from sensors, only the monocular camera on board of the of the underwater vehicle. Um, finally, these are the conclusions and future work. Um, our main findings for this research was that uh, this experiment should prove of the capability of the underwater of the underwater vehicle of positioning itself in real time using this, uh, this vision algorithm. And also that it is possible to perform a trajectory tracking successfully using the estimated relative position obtained by the vision algorithm. This is of particular interest because this system can be used instead of the acoustic instead of an acoustic communication device that can be more expensive. Also, this method of position estimation can be used in, in a variety of works so or for different purposes. And for future work, this algorithm, this algorithm can further be improved by adding a camera pulse estimation as well. Since you, you saw the, our results and our equations, we only estimate the position, but not the pulse. The, but it can be further improved, so making that estimation as well. Uh, so we can remove some of the current limitations of this algorithm. Um, that would be all. That would be all. Thank, Thank you very much. much. You have Thank you. A question? Thank you very much for your presentation. We are uh, proceeding for the questions. Is there anyone here who would like to ask a question? Also on the virtual session, is there anyone who would like to ask a question? What is your question? Yeah. There is a reason to put your lens or your lighting in certain geometry figures. Yeah, because the the certain uh, it's not that this that figure or that uh, this position had something special. It just had to be a determined one that we knew the, the real measurements in real life uh, outside of the water, and also the this position this position had to have some constraints. That's why we use different color for the lens. It has to be something that we know and can work through logic. Like the, this LED is the right 
the red left is on the right side, the blue left is on the the side, and we, that, that's the only condition that must be met for the marker. But the actual geometry can, can vary. The number of LEDs also can vary. It just need to be a specific geometry that it is previously known. For example, you can have multiple vehicles on the, on the same uh, test, and each one has a different geometry. Uh, so the algorithm can, uh, that, that would be like a further improvement improvement, but yet to the algorithm will detect each of the geometries in an independent way. That's okay. what happens if you have multiple sources of light with the same color? Uh, for example, in the image, if you saw this much, uh, there was a reflection on the surface. Of the, it was the same marker that was reflected on the surface, so it was inverted. Uh, those lights had the same color because it was a direct reflection of the lights of the marker. And the algorithm was developed so it can distinguish from those lights from from the lights that are actually belonging to our marker. Here it is, that image. This is the next one. Ah, this one. So the lights in the, that are reflected on the surface are the same color as the ones on the map. And yeah, that's why there are a couple of filters, the colors, the disposition, the, the constraints between the lights. So there are many things into consideration for this. Okay. Another question? Yeah, I have a question about what is the size of the image? Uh, because it's not the same RGB and then RGB. So the space of the image is very important because to describe the, uh, the image about the disagree, uh, when you contrast the picture, then you yeah. have different patterns. So uh, you, you, have, um, you have to know the space of the image and previously. Um, well, for example, here for these experiments, we had a, we used an 800 times uh, 600 uh, space of the image, but mostly because of the to ease the processing of the real-time video. We can use a, an HD, so it could be more accurate and we could, we could detect a smaller lights, but it would come as a computation, a higher computational cost. Oh, okay. But, um, but yeah. the, the size of the image can vary and the algorithm can work with different sets of images. It just would be better if the size of the image is bigger because the detected LEDs can be smaller. But that's the only thing that, that concerning. Oh, and also the computational cost of using higher images in your stream. But, but that's the only concern about the size. Do you use Ah, no, no, no. It, it was a video stream. It was a video. Oh, yeah, it was a it was a video stream. That, that's when I should use. Yeah, it was it wasn't an image, a format of an image. Mm -hmm. It was. Uh, an actual video stream that it, it these are the frames per second, mm -hmm. so twenty four frames per second, and we got the frame we got it as a as a matrix. Okay. And the, the the image was actually in the internal process of the algorithm a, a matrix of so the how size many of the frame. For each one? Excuse me. Oh, so how many layers did you use for every frame? How many layers? How about the to obtain the pixels? Uh, well, uh, it was an RGB frame, so the size of the matrix was the same size of the frame, but had three channels. In one of the three channels was each one of these RGB colors. So it was 800 times 800 times 3. That was the size of the actual matrix that we processed. Another question, we have time for another question. Well, one question from my part. Um, okay. In the slide number 12, this one, this one. Yeah. Uh, there are two regions of green light uh, uh, in the upper part of the image. Yeah. Those are also LEDs or those no. are reflections of reflections the of the surface of the sun or any other 
external source of light. And in that particular case, I think it was in the sky. Sky. That is the problem when it's near the surface. Yeah, that, yeah, that is a particular problem that this uh, algorithm tries to tackle. So uh, that that was the sense of my question. There could be some some uh, some reflections that could yeah, there, induce a mistake. Uh, uh, not actually a mistake because it, this was one of the main considerations for the development of this algorithm that it can detect external sources and filter them from entering the, the calculation of the, of the positioning, but it can hamper the uh, it can hamper the algorithm because they are detecting too many lights and it ha they have to process all of them. But it is specifically made for filtering all of the external sources. It could be the surface, the sun, the, and other lights that are in a submarine. Or, or a reflection. Or, or a reflection. Same, yeah. The same. The same. Let's. Yeah, but that, that was specifically intended to prevent. Okay. Well. Uh, so it would be easier to implement this. Do you consider it could be easier to implement this algorithm, for example, outside the water, in the air, for example? It, it can also be implemented in, uh, on the air. The yeah. air. I don't think it would be easier because. Uh, where when you find external sources of light on an underwater environment, it's it is strange. It is uh, it is an event that it's not typical of underwater operation. Mm -hmm. it, it can prevent this algorithm prevents that, those events from hampering the tracking. But if you are using it uh, outside of the water, then uh, it will be it it wouldn't it wouldn't be an event. It would be all the time. There would be external sources of light. It could work as well, but it would be slower because it would be detecting different and uh, many sources of external light that it would need to filter. But yeah, I, I, I also made experiments out of the water just for for getting right the estimation and the detection. And yeah, it, it works as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's time for the last the last uh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time for the last presentation of this of this session uh, and the paper presented is called uh, on implementation of the light versus layer with position and velocity feedback and it's presented by Mr. Martin Hernandez Villa uh, also authored by the doctor Daniel Alejandro Victor Aguilar and Dr. Gerardo, Gerardo Silva Navarro. Uh, this presentation, I understand, is to be given uh, virtually. So, uh, anytime you're ready, you can proceed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see the cover of your presentation. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I am Luis Hernandez Villa from EPCIT. Um, I will to present the following work is on implementation of the layer resonator uh, with position and velocity feedback. Um, this uh, work was realized uh, with my advisor, the professor Daniel Melcher Aguilar, and in collaboration with the professor Gerardo Silva Navarro. So let's start. Um, first, as an introduction, let's talk about um, of the delay resonator. Consider the, uh, the single degree of freedom system in the figure one, which is respectively an uh, equation on motion. Uh, in this case, uh, U represents the control input. So what is the concept about the the delay resonator. The main idea behind of the DR is to intentionally introduce um, a delay in the feedback uh, to induce a stable oscillatory uh, solution in the single degree of freedom system, even in the presence of the existing damping. Um, this concept was introduced by Olga and Hom Hansen uh, and the D-referent one. Using by using the light position feedback given this equation two, 
So in this context, um, the structure C consists in to select the gain G and the delayed H such that the characteristic and function associated with the system has two zeros on the imaginary axis of the complex plank, while all the other zeros uh, remain in the left half plank. Uh, for example, consider we consider the following um, parameters of the primary uh, the single degree of freedom system and selecting the gain and G for this value. And this is the delay. And we obtain the following behavior of the closed loop system one, two uh, in the figure two. As we can see in the subfigure A, we have the location of the zero of the characteristic function associated with the closed loop system. And in the figure B, we obtain the oscillatory behavior uh, decided for this configuration. So once uh, the single degree of freedom system behave in an oscillatory way, despite the existing damping, uh, then can be used uh, as an ideal dynamic vibration absorber when it's interconnected to a primary system. Uh, how, uh, as we can see in the figure three, uh, we have the primary system uh, interconnected to a secondary system based on an delay resonator. Uh, here, in this case, F um, is the external force uh, acting on the primary system. Um, so following the principal uh, idea of the vibration absorption, where see if the frequency um, resonance of the secondary system is the same that the um, frequency of, uh, of the perturbation force, then um, this, this vibration of the primary system are ideally suppressive. Uh, in other words, um, if the DR design is toned to the disturbance frequency, then one can expect to cancel the vibration of the primary system. And for, for this, uh, let's uh, see the following, the, the next example. Uh, consider now the parameters of the primary system. And the parameters of the secondary system are the same considering in the previous example. Uh, for this case, the external force is given by this harmonical function, and this is the um, disturbance frequency. So, in fact, uh, in the previous example, we designed the DR for this oscillation frequency. So, in the figure four, uh, we see how during for the 10 first seconds, uh, the interconnected system is in open loop, and after that, the control out is applied, observing a high attenuation in the um, primary system. Okay, um, and other DR configuration are using uh, velocity or acceleration feedback. Uh, we see the paper two where a complete review of DR configuration is presented. On, uh, an interesting configuration is present in the work three by using velocity and non delaying position. On the other hand, in the recent paper, we propose a new DR configuration with the larger velocity and position feedback given by this equation three. Actually, in this work four, the complete stability region was characterized in the feedback gain space and based on such a stability result, then the next algorithm of design at the area was also proposed. This is the, the design algorithm for a DR with the velocity and position feedback present in the work four. Um, in this algorithm, we are easily shown how the, the given the parameters of the system, um, we can select the delay and the feedback gains and to obtain oscillatory behavior at the desired frequency. Besides, it's important to mention that this DR configuration allows to assign a different oscillation frequency by only changing the gains, the feedback gains G1 and G2, but no change the delay. Now, this is in contrast with the other DR configurations. And this is clear in this proposal algorithm because we only need to, uh, to repeat the steps four, five, and six. So um, 
the main goal of this work is prove, uh, to prove experimentally that the, this new DR configuration induced oscillation in a real uh, single degree of freedom system has well evaluated its capabilities in suppressing vibration when it's interconnected to a real primary system. So for this uh, purpose, we use the following experimental platform. Um, it's a rectilinear plan uh, provided by educational control products. Uh, see the figure five. This uh, mechanical system consists in a uh, mass carries interconnected by the sprints and the displacement um, of the of the these mass carries um, are obtained from a high resolution optical encoders. And for the control force, um, it's obtained from a roadless type servo motor. On the other hand, the external excitation force are obtained from a, this uh, small DC motor. And the signal uh, control processing are obtained throughout a high speed DCP board uh, installed in a PC with, uh, under Windows 7 uh, with MATLAB Simulink. And the selected sampling frequency for the overall system was in one kilohertz. Uh, first, uh, we proceed to identify the real parameters of the experimental platform. Um, for identifying the stiffness contents, uh, we apply the stiff functions of different magnitudes and measure the displacement. And then from the obtaining data, we estimated the, the constant key. On the other hand, for identifying the natural frequency and damping ratio, um, we apply a sinusoidal sweep from zero to six hertz during the 90 seconds. Um, from the obtaining data, um, estimated the parameters by using the peak picking method. And so the estimated parameters uh, we can see in, in the table one. So in the figure six, we can observe the comparison of the experimental results and numerical simulation for these parameters. Um, we can see how the simulated model fits quite well with the experimental data. Okay, now uh, we continue to design and, the, and implementation of the control. Uh, first, uh, we observe the estimated damping ratio is this value. On the other hand, uh, the proposed algorithm must satisfy this restriction. That is, uh, the algorithm worked for this value of the impin ratio. So, in order to apply the algorithm, to, uh, we propose to inject a virtual damping via an additional velocity feedback given by this equation seven. And uh, so, simple calculations. Uh, show that si the value of key satisfies this inequality, then uh, the, damping, the condition on the damping ratio holds. And for the previous estimated parameters, uh, we have that this um, inequality for the damping ratio. No, sorry, sorry, for this value for the KD. And um, so we chose now the value of KD equal to this, this um, quantity, and then obtain the damping ratio is equal to 0 0.5. And now we can apply the, the algorithm for this DR configuration. First, uh, we can compute, we compute the values of A and D respectively. And from four, uh, we obtain the next inequality for the delay and select the delay equal to 12 milliseconds. Then the interval for the, this desired frequency is, uh, is in this frequency range. As a remark, the experimental platform has an effective operation bandwidth from 0 to 8 hertz. And for the experimental validation of the DR, we perform two different experiments. Uh, for the first experiment, uh, we select these gains and obtain, sorry, we select this frequency, this oscillating frequency, and we obtain these uh, feedback gains. And besides, as we mentioned it previously, uh, we can change this oscillation frequency only by changing the feedback gains. So we're, we're relied as a second experiment now for this um, oscillation frequency, and we have the feedback gains respectively. And another remark, 
for the implementation of the velocity feedback. We use a load pass filter for removing the undesired noises. And now in the figure seven and eight, uh, show the experimental validation for each frequency. Uh, as we can see during the first three seconds, we perform the, the system in open loop. And as, uh, and sorry for the, um, by applying uh, a step function at five um, newtons. And after these three seconds, um, we apply the design control law for the delay resonator. As we can see in both the experiments, um, how the control law induces the desired DR behavior at this design frequency. And now we proceed to evaluate the active vibration absorption capacities of the DR. So following the same methodology, we estimate the parameters now for the primary system, uh, which are shown in the table two. And for the experimental setup, the primary system is disturbed by this force given by this harmonical function. Uh, rem 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 remind the active control law is given by this equation seven. And for the experimental validation, we consider this uh, disturbance frequency. And in fact, um, this frequency are the same that they, we are designed previously for the DR. And so during for the five, the first five seconds, the interconnected system is in open loop. And after that, the control out is applied. So how was Kins, had we can see in the figure nine, uh, during the first five seconds, uh, there is some uh, vibration attenuation on the primary system, even though the control lab is not applied yet. Uh, this attenuation is because the secondary system performed has a conventional passive vibration absorber. Then when the DR starts to act to after the, these five seconds, the secondary system becomes on an active vibration absorber designed at this disturbing frequency, and then a high attenuation of the vibration um, on the primary system is achieved. So similarly, uh, this happens in, in the second experiment in the figure 10. It is true that the attenuation is not so marked that the, um, during, during the first five seconds. This is because we move away from the resonance frequency of the passive absorber. However, uh, a high attenuation is observed after the five seconds when the DR is applied. And so uh, in the following video, we can see the experimental validation for the um, Previous experiment and in the figure 10. Uh, rem uh, remember, what, uh, this is the primary system and this is the secondary system. And the primary system is disturbed by this, this small DC motor. And, okay, wait a moment, okay. This is the disturber frequency. And we can observe how after the, these five seconds, the vibration on the primary system are suppressed. So um, finally, these are some important conclusions of this work. In general, the experimental validation of the DR are achieved with good results. Um, also in the experiment for two different frequencies, only the feedback gains have been changed, but not the delay value. And it is important for the easy implementation of these experiments. And also more, um, the use of the time dilemma as a control parameter can be employed to extend the tunic capacities and robustness of the classical passive vibration absorber. So thank you for the attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And we are proceeding to the uh, session of questions. Uh, is there somebody here who would like to ask a question also in the virtual session? Anyone who would like to ask a question about this work? Okay. Well, 
Ahí estaba el question. Uh, so you are using the elate to help you uh, tune, help you with the tuning of the of the uh, absorber, the parameters, the gains of the controller for the absorber. Is that what could be concluded from the work? Sorry, I don't hear you very well, the, the question. Okay, okay, I will try to speak louder. Uh, the reason you include uh, delay in the, in the system helps you with the uh, finding of the control gains of toning your system? Uh, actually, uh -huh. um... Um, here, um, indeed, we are using this um, in principle this um, control law for the DSDR configuration, the, the given in the equation three. So, basing in this work, this is the work for um, my advisor and, 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 and me. Um, what characterizes first the complete uh, stability region? Uh, for these gains, given any any delay after that, for we propose the this algorithm for design a DR, and actually in this case, um, the delay uh, most satisfied this inequality. And yes, uh, the idea, the main idea uh, in the DR is use the delay as a parameter control. As a control parameter, okay. So uh, using this uh, delay actually helps you to have some more degrees of freedom when when designing this type of of uh, absorbers, vibration absorbers. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's right. So there is uh, there is some some use because usually uh, some of the, most of the times. When dealing with uh, control systems, delays are something we don't want to, to to get into. But here it seems that uh, you can find a good use for them, isn't it? Yes, actually, yeah. And in many cases, the uh, delay is considered destroying to dynamical and, and nothing. Maybe in sometimes undesirable. For and in constant in this work and actually the the science this this uh, was introduced um, the 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 light is introduced intentionally for this purpose and even in the existing damping the delay um, performed performed this this. Um, uh, oscillatory behavior. Okay, so here in this slide that you are showing us, this this specific slide, those zero locations, uh, the original ones are those in the uh, J omega axis. Yes, yes, is it is it is it the idea? Uh, is to select the, this the the gain and the delay for um, such that the, the characteristic function associated with this uh, respectively system has uh, two zeros on the imaginary axis. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have those two zeros, zeros, and when you are uh, changing, well, when you are uh, introducing the delay. You have these other behaviors, these other zero locations. Yes, actually, yeah, but uh, this um, is well the the zero domain and all the all the others because this is the the um, spectral abscess uh, concept. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anyone? else you'd like to ask a question?
Lourdes Martín. Hi, hi, professor. From your presentation, find some feedback controller based on the time delay in a game, a custom game. But your training methodology is apparently simple. Is it something the issues be to be expected to get a Sorry, sorry, professor. I can hear very well the the question. Sorry. Let me repeat. You can know. <laughs> you can come here, maybe. Yeah. I I will put the microphone volume. Luis Martin. Hi, hi, professor. Yes. <laughs> Que tu control retroalimentado basado en, en una ganancia y un retardo en el tiempo eh, se utiliza para una metodología de sintonización de tu descripción. Sorry, I'm, not, I'm speaking in Spanish. From your uh, explanation in your presentation, it seems to be a part of simple, but. Uh, uh, can you say some remarks about the stability issues because uh, G and Tau uh, has to be uh, selected to respect the closed loop stability? And that's the main drawback uh, on your methodology and your research. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for your question. Yes, actually, um, in contrast with other VR configurations, uh, the methodology for um, obtain this behavior is not so uh, easy and actually in the work and for um, basing in their stability result um, is that the algorithm result is easy but the um, uh, how do you say the um, analysis be, um, behind for for this um, algorithm is is uh, complicated and for example um, in this um, in the first and in this um, VR configuration we obtain this behavior fears um, Plotting all the road locus for for the only for this uh, specific gain and this specific delay, and after that uh, compute and obtain some this this um, behavior. No, and in this case, um, obtain. Um, how do you say a um, range of parameters for for the DR works is um, in in where our opinion is an analytical result um, very um, more or less um, strictly uh, than the other design of uh, DRs. Okay, it seems that we had another question from uh, Dr. Hugo Abundis. Um, I don't know if he would like to still ask his question. Hi to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. All right, clear. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, can you put your conclusion, please? The last one, I mean, why do you conclude that? I didn't see a, a comparison between active vibration scheme versus passive vibration scheme. Yeah, actually, in this conclusion is more, more um, to a um, um, future work, but um, in these cases, but this um, 
comparison with the DR is not applied yet. And we observe what the, um, we are so, um, in the figure then, we from away the, the frequency, the resonance of the passive absorber, uh, we move that and we apply the DR configuration and obtain this, this behavior on the, old, on, the, on the primary system. Okay. Uh, you, are, you are exciting your primary system in resonance, isn't it? Yes, in, in, in the figure, in the experiment um, for this frequency, show in the figure nine, actually um, we excited the, the primary system to a frequency, um, the resonant frequency in the secondary system. Okay, and you, you get a very good absorption. Yes. You can also get a very the same good absorption with a passive control scheme. Yes, actually, uh, if, if this is a, the the was um, uh, obtaining that. Okay, thank you, Luis Martin. Thank, thank you, Professor, for your question. Okay. Well, I guess that's all the questions. Thank you very much. Your work is. Very interesting. We appreciate your contribution to the CCE 2022 conference, and uh, we give you. <laughs> and with this, we are closing this session about mechatronics. And thank you very much for your attendance.